If you are uh, new to our, our Lenten midweek worship, you should have taken one of the uh, um, worship uh, folders that are right here by Mac. You want to raise your hand? Mac? There you go, right by that guy. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, to, to take fully in the service. Please stand. <clears throat> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, source of all goodness and life, who clothes us with Christ Jesus and makes us holy by his Spirit. Blessed be God forever. In peace let us pray to the in the church and the healing of creation let us pray Here pray. Holy God, as evening comes upon us today, bless each of us in our sleep, strengthen us for the day ahead, and may we rise with your Son and share the good news and the opportunities laid before us. Amen. Watch your Lord with
searching ones. Grant us all your peace. may be seated as we hear from Pastor Sherry. Much better. A reading from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And then a brief reading, and I mean brief, from the 10th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Just two tiny verses, verses 38 and 39. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. The word of the Lord. Amen. A lot of my ministry, as you'll hear in just a moment, has involved journeying with individuals and with congregations in some kind of discernment, where they're asking questions about who are we? What is God calling us to do? So when Pastor Carl invited staff members to share a little bit of their faith journey, their call story during these Lenten services, it's probably no surprise that my first thought went to some of the call narratives in the Bible. And of all those narratives, I think the one from 1 Samuel is one of my very favorite. Now, it is always wise to be careful in um, doing this kind of work because you don't want to over-identify with the prophet Samuel, right, in the call story in that particular book. But there is something about this story, something about this particular call narrative in the Old Testament that has resonated with me for a really long time. Some of you know that I grew up in Baltimore, Ohio, just down the road. And one of the reasons I first resonated with this little glimpse from uh, 1 Samuel is because I was not really in a priestly family as I was growing up, at least not at that point. My, uh, my parents had both grown up in some version of the church, and, um, but had long been 
disappointed by um, the hypocrisy and the brokenness that they saw in the church. And they had long kind of drifted away. So as I was growing up, initially, church was not really even a part of my primary lived experience. I went to church with Grandma and Grandpa on Easter, but that was about it in those early days. But when we moved to Baltimore, my, my parents are from the Baltimore area. They both graduated from the same high school, Liberty Union. Um, but when we moved back there, after they had been around away for a few years, I, one of my very first friends turned out to be the daughter of the local UCC pastor, one of several UCC pastors, but the daughter. And that church, Trinity UCC in Baltimore, became my first church home. It was the place where I did Sunday school and children's choir, where I was in the Christmas pageant. In my most memorable role, I was literally a little angel. <laughs> it was the place where I connected for community vacation Bible school and serving as an acolyte when I was far too short to reach any of the candles, none of which were as easy to light as the ones that are here today. And it's where I first attended catechism class. But that's actually where things changed a little bit. I loved the study of catechism. I loved catechism night. I was a little bit of an impish student, a little mischievous. One day I got into trouble in catechism and the pastor said, fine, you can teach the class next week. And to him, it was an empty threat. He came back the next week, he had totally forgotten about it and I had a lesson plan ready to go. But as much as I enjoyed that class, as much as I enjoyed my classmates, I enjoyed the pastor, I enjoyed the content, the sitting and reading and doing the homework and doing all of the things to learn more about the Bible, to learn more about God. As much as I loved all of that, when I reached the end of catechism, I just wasn't sure about being confirmed there. It didn't qu feel quite right. I didn't feel quite at home in spite of the fact I loved everybody around me and it was the place I had become connected to over the course of, you know, almost a decade at that point. So in the end, I decided not to be confirmed with all of my classmates and all of my, and, my, and you know, if you're from this area, you realize my classmates were also my classmates, right? They were everybody that I saw, all my friends. We were in the band and the chorus and the classes and everything. And I just decided that that was not quite right for me. But the problem was that in that particular congregation, at that particular time, by deciding not to become confirmed, I had effectively excommunicated myself from the congregation because that was the gateway to communion in that particular time and place. So that left me feeling even a little less rooted in the, in the story. And I, for a while I went to Sunday school and then I would just go on home because it just didn't feel quite right no matter how much I loved the people and loved the place. If you've ever heard of the term somebody being a seeker, wow, that is what I became. I began to research various faiths and traditions, but it probably won't come as a surprise to you that in the 1970s and 80s in Baltimore, Ohio, if you wanted to investigate and learn more about a number of religious traditions, that involved the library. There wasn't anybody else, any place else you were going to go. The religious diversity was pretty limited in the moment. But I spent a lot of time at the library. I spent a lot of time reading and studying and watching movies and doing things that just kind of led into this deep fascination, it turns out, with Judaism and Catholicism. Because I loved the structures and the rituals and the traditions and being a part of a global community that seemed so much bigger than what I was used to in my small town in that small corner of the world. When I got to high school, a different friend invited me to her Lutheran church in Lancaster, the big city. <laughs> and it felt immediately like I found some of the pieces I had been craving, that they began to come together. I was the kid that got, the high school kid that got, that got gifted one of those tiny little Lutheran book of worships, if you've been around long enough, right? It's like this big, had that with me every Sunday. And that was the moment where I think I started to realize 
that the phrase, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, was beginning to take hold in some new ways in my life. Because finding that kind of spiritual home and being involved in so much in that congregation, in worship and education and service opportunities and the choirs, that gave me the space out of which to kind of let that connection grow into what might come next. But one of the most important things about St. Peter Lutheran Church in Lancaster, Ohio was this. They participated in the internship program at Trinity Lutheran Seminary. And I was on the internship committee. So that means that every single fall, year after year, some new student in their third year of seminary education would show up on our doorstep and try to learn how to become a pastor. And I got to walk alongside all of those students and watch them grow and hear their stories and hear their ways of talking about their own call story, their own faith journey. And I listened to them talk about seminary formation, and I began to consider the possibility that the Holy Spirit might be stirring up something in my life as well. I went off to college, Ohio State University. I would say the, but it sounds a little presumptuous when you're preaching from the pulpit. So we'll just say OSU. And in um, recent years, one of the things that I have done uh, in an undergraduate context is some um, academic advising with students who are exploring and deciding what they're going to major in. And I used to tell them as a, as, a, as a sort of like, it's going to be okay moment in that advising kind of conversation, look, I changed my major five times in college and I graduated on time. It's going to be okay. But I left out the most important part of that sentence, which is I should have changed it a sixth because I still didn't really end up in something that I planned to spend my life doing. I graduated with a degree in speech and hearing science and not so unlike catechism in junior high school, I loved the learning, but found myself completely convinced that was not the work I was called to do. So I left college and I took a position with the Social Security Administration and I remember having, about a year and a half into my role in the Social Security office, I worked with the Title 16 program. And I remember going home, driving home, I was living in Columbus at the time, but I was working in Lancaster, and, and I had had the best day I had ever had in that role. I felt like I had been able to help the people who came in, that I had been um, someone who could make a space of welcome, that could help them move to a place where they were gonna receive some, some um, support and the things that they needed. It was the best day I had ever had working for the Social Security Administration and with absolute utter clarity, I realized, and that is not enough. That having that wonderful day, but being in the wrong space was insufficient. So I passed my home, I drove on to Trinity and I picked up the application and completed it that particular weekend. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In those days, in the, the days in which Pastor Carl and I were at Trinity, we sometimes, in the broader church, we sometimes talked about students who were pipeliners, who came right through college and right into seminary, and students who were second career students. They had had some other work and service and something else that happened um, before they came on into seminary. And I used to describe myself as second career enough to have furniture, but not second career enough to have a savings account. <laughs> I'd had about three or four years in between college and seminary, and that was enough for some of those things to develop. But I had a wonderful experience at that institution. I had, I loved the coursework, I loved the contextual pieces, the places where you're out in the church experiencing things. My own internship, when it finally came around, was in Detroit, Michigan at Gracious Savior Lutheran Church at seven and a half mile in the Lodge Freeway, part of an active urban Detroit Lutheran coalition of churches, and it was amazing. And I loved the city. And so my first call was to the west side of Cleveland, a little church called Gloria Dei. 
I used to get, if you, if you know Gloria Day, that's spelled, you know, Gloria and then D-E-I, you know, response to God. But I used to get mail addressed to Mrs. Gloria Day, D-A-Y, um, Doris's sister, I suppose. It was a wonderful, it was the world's most wonderful first call congregation because I was there about seven years and I think I can firmly say that not once did anyone say to me, we've never done it that way before, Pastor. Every time we decided to try something new, it didn't always work, but folks were willing to just, let's give it a try. Let's see where it leads. Let's just have some fun in this work together. But after about seven years, I realized that I was also still missing an academic context. So I did the thing I thought was the next best thing to that, and I applied to a PhD program in Denver, and I went out there and, again, loved it. Spent one year there and was immediately aware that I was going to spend a lot of money, graduate from that school, and immediately go back to doing the thing I was already doing, and that seemed like a financially unwise decision. I came back to another call in the Northeastern Ohio Synod, which is, by the way, where I'm still on the roster of the church. I'm still connected to Northeastern Ohio. As much as my life has gone in so many different directions, that's the place that I call home in terms of my connection to, to rostered ministry and rostered church life. But after a couple of years, a few years, a way opened up that I wasn't expecting. I was invited to come back to Trinity and to serve a decade later, after graduating, as the director of admission. And I realized that was the thing that was going to allow me to do that kind of vocational discernment that I loved, working with folks who are trying to decide where God is calling them. And I could do that full time and be a part of an academic setting and still be a part of church ministry and leadership. I had such amazing colleagues and students. I reconnected with the person who was going to become my future spouse. I traveled across the country to campus ministries and church camps and other kinds of church gatherings and got to preach in so many different places and walk with students from so many different areas in the world and areas in, and spaces in their own discernment journey. And I worked on staff with Laura Book, so some of you will remember. And again, I was there about seven years, and then I realized that the thing that I felt like I was missing in this discernment piece, I loved the discernment. I loved those, my very favorite part about admissions work was meeting with prospective students and listening to their stories like this one, and listening to the ways in which God had been living and active in their lives in so many different ways. But what I discovered I was missing was a variety of answers, because when you are the director of admission at a seminary, the answers all sort of are the same thing, right? Where is God calling you? Well, here. That's why I'm sitting in your office to have this conversation. And I was hoping to be in a space where I might say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening, and have the answers be things like, I think God's calling me to become a chemist, or a teacher, or a lawyer, or a nurse, or a community organizer. And so just through a random set of circumstances, I discovered a position called the director of the Center for Career and Vocation at Bluffton University, which is a Mennonite school in Northwest Ohio, where I could work with undergraduates who were asking those big questions. That's the space in which I got to advise all of the students on campus who were exploring or deciding on a major. And actually, I would probably, I was there about five years, and I think I would have stayed there a lot longer, because um, you'll find out I had trouble sort of breaking away from it. But it was very hard for Lynn to follow her call in Northwest Ohio. There just wasn't that much around us. We were in a tiny little, we were in a tiny little hamlet that was about seven miles away from the tiny little town that was Bluffton. And we yearned to be back in Columbus, near family and friends. And so at my own assembly, Northeastern Ohio Synod Assembly, in the summer of 2019, one of the assistants to the bishop said, have you ever thought about being an interim pastor? I wonder if some of that work would still be that kind of discernment piece. And boy, was he correct. And so once again, my response was, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Tell me what this is about. 
And it turns out that working in, in transitional, intentional transitional and interim ministry is not so unlike academic advising. It's like helping a congregation choose a major or a pastor in the course of their work. So I spent almost two years at Zion Lutheran Church in Worcester, where Pastor Kathy Halleisen was once on staff, all these connections. Um, and it was two years because of the pandemic, because that would probably have been about a nine to 12 month um, interim, but it extended because of uh, uh, entering into the, the pandemic in 2020. And even during that time, I continued to stay connected to Bluffton and continued to do some work for them. They were going through a series of transitions and I just so loved those folks and loved those connections and loved that work with undergraduates. So I kept those two things going until recently, about a year and a half ago when I began doing some contract work here amongst this wonderful gathering of God's people. And now I'm also back at Trinity Lutheran Seminary in a new role focused on formation and worship and still discernment. Over and over that piece keeps coming back. And it's important, especially now, because it is absolutely a time in the life of all of our institutions and the life of the larger church where we are collectively gathering and asking, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. What comes next? What does the next expression of our life together look like? So I bring this today, all these stories of discernment, bringing me up to this present moment, but I'm actually going to go beyond this present moment because all of our stories, our journeys, they don't end just right here when we start telling them. You may have noticed that the Luke 10 passage I read stopped in an unfamiliar, faith, unfamiliar place. It didn't go far enough for you to hear Jesus' response to Mary and Martha. And I liked stopping it there because I'm not so sure that finding the right answer is always the point of that passage. It seems to me that both Mary and Martha are doing their very best to respond faithfully to Jesus in their midst. As I hope we all are doing every day, every moment. And I will say at this point in my life, I go back and forth between my Mary and Martha moments. And I value them both. But I'm seeking a new balance, I suspect. I love Martha's spirit of hospitality. She leaps into action. She wants everyone to feel welcome. She is the one in the story that is making and keeping sacred space for Jesus and for his disciples. And Mary is the one in the story who brings the spirit of prayer and quiet and meditation and worship. She's the one who's okay just being in the sacred space in the story. And I think that is probably the space I stand in now, trying to figure out where at any given time am I supposed to be headed? Is it a Mary, is it a Mary moment in the church? Is it a Martha moment? And I hope if you find yourself in a similar space as I do, that we will all continue on this journey with those words on our lips. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Amen.
Please stand for our prayers. celebrate the goodness of receiving a call from you claimed in the waters of baptism Lord what could bring us more joy than hearing your voice give us direction Lord give us ears to hear and the acceptance of your forgiveness as we move through life trying to find that niche that you hope for each of us Lord, expand our view so that we might see the richness of the opportunities that lay before all of us. That we might find the goodness and even roads that we travel that might not be our roads, but are nonetheless good places to be, good journeys to be on. Lord, expand our vision so that we might see the possibilities that each of our lives have and have the courage to say here I am Lord remember me when you come into your kingdom Jesus remember me when you come into your Those who are on our hearts this evening, we say their names aloud now or silently. All those we know who are grieving. Mary. Pray for all those battling diseases that are wrecking their bodies. for all those fighting valiantly mental health issues. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into Give us our debts as 
Bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon all of you with favor and grant you God's peace. Amen. We leave with him 324 in the cross of Christ thy glory. peace and serve the Lord. Amen.